Well, good afternoon and welcome to RBC Disruptors. I'm John Stackhouse. It's my pleasure to host our monthly conversation about disruption, innovation, and how technology is changing everything around us. To those of you in the room today, thanks for braving the elements. We got a good storm outside, uh, but a nice safe harbor uh, here, in, uh, here in Halifax. To those of you around the world joining us on WebEx and Facebook Live, welcome as well to the conversation. And please be part of the conversation. You can send your questions and comments through Facebook Live. We'll get them on screens here and insert them in, uh, in uh, today's conversation, which is about the future of shipping. Can't think of a better place than Halifax to have this conversation. So people have been moving goods out of here and in here for centuries. In fact, if you just walk a few blocks from here, you'll hit the port of Halifax. Uh, which has been active for centuries and was where some of the early disruption in shipping took place. In fact, in the 1840s, it was a gentleman named Samuel Cunard, you may know the name from the Cunard shipping uh, line, who transformed shipping by filling his vessels with mail and sending it back and forth across the Atlantic, created a whole new industry and disrupted the way we communicate. Uh, Sir Samuel's son, William, went on to found the Merchant Bank of Canada which became RBC. So our roots in shipping go way back. Our roots in Halifax are, are deep, and, uh, deep and proud. That sort of disruption is taking place again here in Halifax. But instead of mail, they're using data to transform how we approach shipping. And we've got two extraordinary people to walk us through some of the big ideas that are changing the way the world moves goods. Karen Oldfield, many of you here know her. She's the CEO of the Halifax Port Authority. And Todd Scott, who's come from Dallas, from uh, IBM, he runs global trade, blockchain, and global trade at uh, IBM and sees shipping and ports around the world. Todd and Karen, welcome to RBC Disruptors. My pleasure. Thanks, John. Thanks for being part of the conversation. Now, one thing we can't control is the weather. We had a third guest from Maersk who was grounded. He's in Portland, Maine this evening, but uh, <laughs> he may be watching on Facebook Live and uh, sharing, uh, sharing comments uh, as, uh, as well. But Karen, let's uh, start with you to kick off the conversation. Maybe you can give us a sense of the Port of Halifax and where you're trying to take it in this digi digital revolution. Sure. So Port of Halifax, the fourth largest port in Canada, so behind Vancouver, Montreal, Prince Rupert, and Halifax. Uh, traditionally, a uh, Atlantic port, uh, Europe Atlantic. And over the past 10, 15 years, we've converted that to being connected with Southeast Asia. So approximately half of our cargo today is to from Asia, Southeast Asia. Our lines of business include containerized cargo, project cargo, and Cruise, the cruise business uh, is a very important part of the economy of the city and the province. Uh, in terms of, you know, economic impact, uh, we would there would be over 12,000 direct and indirect jobs and over 1.7 billion dollars of economic impact. So, if you take a look at what that means to this region, it's important. So, the the. The key for us is to make sure that we stay relevant and, and that we are a port of the future, a port where these cruise vessels, where these container vessels and other vessels want to call. So we are continually looking for the hooks. One, of course, is our bricks and mortar, our infrastructure, and we can talk about that. And the other thing that we are working very hard on is to be uh, the most technically savvy uh, technologically savvy port on the eastern seaboard and that's what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, we'll go, so. get, uh, get into detail on that. I wonder if, if you can give us a bit of a sense though of how technology is changing shipping today. I was down at the port yesterday yeah. and it's fascinating to see these ships, uh, container ships are now 400 meters long, like four football fields together. Sure. And you've got cranes that have to reach across to uh, pull those containers off. But it's the same sort of work that's been done for centuries of taking stuff off boats, putting it onto wheels, and sending it inland. But you're changing that. Changing that and changing it around the world. So autonomous vessels, autonomous um, yard equipment, so you know trucks and so forth. That's not in Halifax. That's still off in the distance. You know, we have our eyes certainly set on it, but there are many ports around the world that have already gone there. Um, and the other key, you know, where technology really hits uh, our business is 
you saw all of those containers, you saw the stacks. Every time you touch a container, it's $50. So you want to make sure that you are minimizing every touch. And, and you do that through technology. And the very best terminal operators and the best ports are the ports that are able to use technology to, to get the containers in and out uh, with the fewest amount of touches. And so, um, you know, I was telling Todd earlier, uh, th that takes a huge amount of a focus. Uh, that is your business. Mm -hmm. That uh, the technology around your container yard is the business. And so, then you add to that hooking up with the trains, hooking up with the trucks, and making sure that their part of the business uh, moves efficiently, effectively, and as quickly as possible. And that, where you know, the technology comes in, connecting the ship to the yard to the train, to the truck. That's the magic. And before we get deeper into that and then talk about wh how significant this is to the, to the economy and, uh, and the entire country, Todd, I wonder if you can give us a global perspective. You're based in Dallas, as I said in the introduction, through IBM. You deal with ports around the world, but also with other industries. Mm -hmm. uh, I, IBM probably, there probably isn't a sector that IBM isn't uh, very active in. Mm -hmm. How does the shipping industry stack up in terms of digital transformation against all the other sectors you uh, see? Yeah. yeah, thanks for the question, John. And uh, first of all, congratulations on a 150 years, celebrating 150 years. That is uh, outstanding. When well, we thought we were accomplishing something, I think we're 108 now, but you guys have us long beat. So uh, congratulations, everyone. Uh, the shipping industry from a technology or digitization standpoint is, uh, quite frankly, um, behind most industries, and I think that that's how they would also describe themselves. We really got into this industry, we've had a long-standing partnership and relationship with Maersk, and we've talked about different business challenges and evaluating what we're doing for them all the time, but in one of the discussions that we had a couple years ago, it really centered around a space that we hadn't discussed, and that is, what are some of the built-in things that happens in the shipping industry that or just co create a lot of inefficiency. And what, obviously what Maersk wanted to do is to solve this uh, for them, but, but as we explored it more, we realized this is more than just the ocean carriers. Uh, this involved ports, it involved terminals, it involved, um, quite frankly, many of the, the beneficial cargo owners are around the world um, as well, and, and it also involved other ocean carriers. So that's really how we started uh, on this journey, but there's a long way to go. There's a lot of progress that can be made, and I'm really, really excited about what we're trying to do with Maersk as well as with the rest of the ecosystem to, to turn the corner. So you say shipping is behind other, other sectors. That seems like a fair, fair comment. Quickly, what, what are the key reasons for that? Well, I think that um, probably the single biggest reason is that when you look at the shipping industry end to end, and I'll, I'll talk about the, the, the movement of cargo, the containers predominantly, it's, it's a margin game. I mean, if the, the banking industry and all, all financial services is going to have much higher margin, so you can explore, you can leverage technology a lot and put it to use to impact your clients a lot faster. Uh, in the shipping industry, it doesn't always work that way. And when you're dealing with thin margins, you just really cannot afford to, to take that many risk. So I'd say that's probably the biggest reason for it. And then well, I'll add a second one. And the second reason is, is that when you change something, it's rare that you can change it by yourself. So I think the ecosystem is very in, in, important. Uh, you know, Karen and I were talking earlier, and I've seen this from from you know, outside looking in about her business, when she changes something, she doesn't just change it for the port um, itself, she changes it for you know, the operator, she changes it, uh, hopefully have an impact on ocean carriers and, all, and truckers uh, as well. So it's the entire ecosystem she's trying to impact, not just, um, not just the port. And that is very important for, for shipping. Unlike other, other industries, you can change things for yourself and then drive that with your clients. It's a little bit, little bit different ecosystem dynamic. I, I think that's right. I just want to add to that because, you know, our, our industry, <clears throat> excuse me, our, our industry, we're part of the supply chain and many, many, many aspects to the supply chain, many silos within each aspect. So you're really trying to you know, work each silo within the larger ecosystem. So there's a myriad of stakeholders, of customers, of influencers, and so moving that 
is very difficult. Mm -hmm. And so you just have to do it piece by piece by piece. Yeah. And I guess when we think about why this, why this matters in the broader, broader context, one of the key, key reasons it matters is that globalization as we've known it over the last 50 years, let's say, yeah. was really created by the container shipping mm -hmm. industry. And then the rest of the supply chain responded to that and lots of good things came of, from that. But that's starting to grind down. We're seeing, you know, over the last decade, a slowdown in global trade. And we need the industry, the, the complete supply chain, but the shipping industry to kind of take us to a new stage of globalization that's going to be data-driven, mm -hmm. going to be empowered by smart technologies, and hopefully help transform uh, great port centers like, uh, like Halifax. One of the uh, tools for that is blockchain. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're both involved in a really interesting blockchain project. So I'll let Todd maybe uh, walk us through that from IBM's perspective, mm -hmm. Trade Lens, yeah. talking yeah. about, and then Karen can help us understand how sure. this matters or, uh, to, uh, to Halifax. Yeah, so um, they're happy to do so. So when I think of, uh, and I happen to, to work for the, our general manager for blockchain, so when I say this to her, I'm sure it probably makes her scratch her head for a second, but uh, I always say that blockchain is not the most important thing. It really isn't. Uh, blockchain is an enabler to solving a particular business problem. So how we like to look at this before we uh, take a look at whether or not blockchain is the right answer, the first question is what's the business problem we're trying to solve? Got to have that well documented and really well thought through. And then the second question, you know, back to the ecosystem comment that Karen made is who are all the players who are involved? And you have to identify them and after you identify them, what's in it for them to change? Now, they're going to be, there should be winners and bigger winners. Mm -hmm. they're, 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 if they're losers, you, you, you better maybe identify that problem early on because they're going to be resistors to change. If, once you've identified the, the business problem, who the players are, how everyone's going to win, now you can start to leverage blockchain as a technology and, and all of its capabilities to solve a particular problem. In this case, uh, of trade lens, what we're trying to solve for is improving the timeliness of information, and we're also trying to improve how the documents that are exchanged because there's lots of paper flow uh, that winds up happening between the carrier and the BCO, the BCO, and the, the porter of customs and all around the loop. Uh, the forwarders involved, the trucking companies are involved. Well, this paper can get lost. And when it gets lost, business stops. So that's predominantly what is going on to the blockchain because you want that to be immutable. You want whatever the status of, of a particular uh, container and documents that are associated with that. You want it to be safe. You want it to be secure. You don't want anyone to be able to alter or, or, or mess around with that unless they have permission to do so. So think about it two ways. There's first, there's tracking where the containers are and being able to give real-time, update, valid information versus what we have today, which is islands of information that could be inaccurate or could be old. So we want to have it all, that all on one platform and then we want to be able to have all the documents that are associated yeah. with those containers um, on the blockchain. So maybe I can just ch um, push you a bit to almost give us a blockchain for dummies uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. If I'm shipping TVs from Asia to North America, mm -hmm. how's that system going to make it uh, better for me? So, so how it's going to be better so is, um, well, today there's a lot, let's, let's use something that's hazardous, right? Because there's always lots of documents, over lots of documents aside with hazardous um, cargo. So the question is, if it's going from, let's just make it up, it's going from um, Shanghai to Halifax. Perfect. Okay. Um, That's those documents that are associated with that, and what we, what we saw when we were, were building a solution is that a lot of times, those documents wind up getting lost. So what happens if a very key, a certificate of origin, let's say that document winds up getting lost. Well, when it gets to Halifax, guess what? that product is not going to be allowed into the country. If it's not allowed into the country, what happens? It sits at port. Well, you want to eliminate that. You want to be able to get the cargo in and out, you, um, the ships in and out. You want to be able to get the cargo in and out so that way you have the most efficient port. The beneficial cargo owner, if they just ship something, they want to be able to know it got delivered so they can get paid. 
So now what the technology will allow is to number one, everyone can see the status of the container. Remember there's two pieces to it. There's the visibility piece and then there's the documents. And then once the documents are exchanged, money can be exchanged, uh, clearance can be, um, can be given right away. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, even to a dummy like me, that was a good explanation. <laughs> Karen, how, how does this play out in Halifax? How does trade lens and blockchain capabilities change what you're able to do? You gotta start with the basic premise that about 20% roughly of the cost of moving the container from origin to destination mm -hmm. is administrative. Wow. Okay? So, so 20%. Take, take that. Take that and let's start talking, Todd. <laughs> because, you know, if you can take a piece of that 20% out and release that to the players in the chain, then you, you're going to uh, be doing a very good thing. So, so taking that thought and then taking our piece at the Port of Halifax, because we only have a piece of it, um, what do we do? So I'll, I'm just going to explain very quickly what we've been doing, and then we can talk about uh, how we have hooked up, so to speak. So in the port, we know that we need to uh, digitize. A little bit of jargon, but uh, <laughs> you know, it's a very paper-intensive industry, extremely paper-intensive. So you know, if, we, if we mapped all of the transactions of one container through the port of Halifax, it would take this whole screen, okay? Just with the regulatory, with all of the people that touch it, with the forwarder, the trucker, the train, the terminal operator, the port authority, et cetera, and a very complicated uh, transactional moves, which are still very paper uh, intensive. So the first thing that we did and are still doing is committed resources to digitize our paper. The second thing that we do is work with our port partners to determine uh, how, can, how we can be on the same basic platform collecting, talking to each other, apples to apples, oranges to oranges. So we, we do that particularly with the most important players, so the terminal operators, uh, the railroad, some of the regulators. So let's assume we can get that sorted. Mm -hmm. Then we've also been working uh, on a pan-Canadian basis. So, you know, there are four primary container uh, ports in the country, as I mentioned earlier. So it, it would be great if all four of us could be using the same basic platform as opposed to de developing different platforms within the four different ports. So, so that's happening. And then we link to a global platform, mm -hmm. which is what we've been doing with TradeLens. So it's kind of coming up from the ground up, so to speak, and all things happening at the same time. So it's a gargantuan effort and uh, you know, a lot of resources and working with many partners. So the, the work that we do um, with IBM locally here is to help us to work to develop that uh, port community and also to help us uh, with the other ports in the country to kind of get on the same page and then uh, specifically to work out some of the problems that uh, Todd has identified with this paper intensive business. So, you know, let me give you a small version. I, I use this um, at IBM Think. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess when I was down there in February. So I, IBM Think is the, that company's mega conference, tens yes. of thousands of people in San Francisco. Correct. This year. Right. Correct. And I had the uh, privilege of, of speaking on this topic. And one of the examples that I used, because I, I need an example to make it real to me, mm. uh, was, you know, vessel comes in, fellow uh, takes this piece of paper, goes down the ladder, goes across the terminal, gets in the taxi, goes to the regulator, uh, uh, gets the paper stamp, calls the taxi, all in reverse. And with blockchain, all of that goes away, right? So there's no more ladder, no more taxi, no more paper, and, and as Todd described it. And so that, that whole activity and the time it takes disappears, and the efficiencies that that come from that are, you know, go right back into the chain and then you, you push that all the way through the chain and you have something that got the other end. 
So one of the great challenges in, in, in this space, and Todd, you were starting to, uh, to, to talk to this, is the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. It's fine you know, if Karen becomes world class at what she's doing, but it's, it's not gonna work if, if the truckers and the rest of the supply chain yeah. mm -hmm. don't get there. So Todd, from what you see around the world, what are kind of some of the best steps or, uh, uh, that any operator can take in terms of building that ecosystem, uh, especially for, for data? Well, oh, so that's a, that's a great question. And I think it does vary from environment to environment. Uh, what I see, for example, in Asia, when they want to uh, make a transition to trade lens, they're not trying to do it like one carrier at a time or one port at a time. They want to bring the entire ecosystem together. And so they will collaborate. They'll say, hey, listen, let's bring a couple of BCOs, let's bring a couple of forwarders, and let's, let's make this work for all of us so that everyone in the ecosystem can be successful. By the way, that is absolutely the way to, to do it. And you know, Karen mentioned that earlier in terms of what she's doing. Those who try to go it alone, and there are many examples, and, and I can share with you many stories, it always fails. And if, if for no other reason it will fail is because uh, in order to make this work, you have, to, you have to sometime engage someone who might be a competitor. And if a competitor feels like you want them to do something and they're not quite sure what they're going to get out of it or if they're going to all of a sudden, you're going to have an upper hand on them, interest level will cease and stop that activity. And it might be the best idea ever, but it'll never get taken off. Unless, it'll never take off unless you have uh, a strategy around governance and uh, a strategy around how everyone in the ecosystem is going to benefit and be really clear about those benefits. Who's doing it, uh, who's doing it well? I think that uh, I, I, there are several places around the world that are doing it well. Um, I don't know if they're, we're, we're trying to get better at this. We've learned a lot over the last 15 months. Um, I'll pick on us. I'll pick on IBM and what we're doing with, with trade lens. We obviously started this partnership uh, with, with, uh, with Maersk. Mm -hmm. And we, we learned very quickly that it's important to have the other major carriers, not just the major players, but also some of the smaller uh, players. Let's just take ocean carriers for example. So now I have a team of, uh, of people that what we do is we focus on ocean carriers. And we have a team of folks who focus on ocean carriers in Asia. Because if you can get one or two of the, the smaller players, others will, will join along. I think we have, a, um, and Tom's not here, unable to make it, but he leads our team focused on ports. It's very important constituency. So, uh, and then we have another team for customs, and we have another team of folks who are focused on BCOs. So that's the only way it gets done, is that you've got to take each of these um, ecosystems. We didn't know that. We didn't do that well at first. We thought we would just build it and, and they will come. That is not how it works. So you've you both been talking about uh, some of the challenges, especially as they uh, a, a apply to ports. And Karen, I, I wonder if you can give us a bit of a, uh, a sense of the competitive landscape when it comes to ports. Because a lot of people probably think, you know, there's not a, much choice. If, if I want to bring TVs in, into Halifax, there's only one way. That's through the, the, the port here. Uh, <laughs> the shipping world is a lot more complex than that. And the port uh, industry, if I can call it that, is a lot more competitive probably than most people appreciate. Give us a sense of the competitive landscape that you deal with. Extremely competitive. Uh, so a little bit about Halifax again. So you know, we, we, we call Halifax a discretionary port. And the reason why is because vessels don't have to come to Halifax. We're not sitting on the population of a New York, as an example. So 23 million people, 25 million people. Uh, our catchment area which is Atlantic Canada is, you know, 2.3 or 2.4 million people. So our market is an inland market. It is Quebec, it is Ontario, and it is the U.S. Midwest, importantly. So, and that's in and out uh, of, of those areas of the country. And so, you know, if i trying to get to Quebec, Ontario and the U.S. Midwest, then I need to be super fast, super efficient. I mean, my whole business model is to be very, very quick. So as opposed to, for example, uh, a New York, where every vessel on the East Coast is going to New York. That's a de rigueur. That's going to happen. So our business model in Halifax, it's always been very interesting because we've had deep water here. 
you know, we're, we're an extremely deep water port. So uh, vessels come here, and they have always come here, to lighten their load, so to speak. So they take the top, take the top skin off, skim off of, of the containers so that they, are, they lighten so they can get into New York, okay? And then coming back across the Atlantic, they come back to Halifax to top up. Okay, so they can go across the Atlantic as heavy as possible. So this, is, this has been our business model. And what's interesting about it is, of course, that has changed as vessels have gotten larger, as uh, New York has raised the Bayonne Bridge, which is, you know, people say a game changer, definitely for New York, but we've had to change too in order to stay in the big ship game. How, how have you had to change? Well, so with the, with the raising of the Bayonne Bridge, that means, and, and as well, uh, the deepening of the channels in New York, it means that larger vessels can now get into New York, vessels that they never would have dreamed of perhaps 15 years ago. So large vessels. So for us to stay relevant, uh, you know, we've always been able to take the big ships, but now we need to be able to take more than one. So as ships become larger, there are more large ships mm -hmm. taking up the capacity. So we need to be able to service those customers. Otherwise, the vessels will just go right on by and go to New York where they're going anyway. So our, our big competitive advantage over New York, just to go back to the, the, the uh, competition, competition issue, is that because of our geographic location, a vessel can uh, come into Halifax, can unload, can be on the train, and can be in Chicago before that vessel can, would have otherwise continued along to New York, mm. unloaded in New York, and gotten to Chicago. So mm. we have a time advantage. And so technology is what helps us maximize and maximize the opportunity presented by that time advantage. So the, the, the prize there is getting those goods to Chicago. Correct. Uh, or, or being the fastest route to Chicago. That's correct. Uh, per se. Give us a sense of what technology advantage you've applied to, uh, to win that race? So I, I could give you three different examples, so then let me try to do some rapid fire. Uh, <laughs> um, so we, we have worked with local partners, local companies, uh, our stakeholders, customers, to develop a port operations dashboard. And the port operations dashboard does a number of things, but uh, two in particular. So we've GPSed um, the terminals and also uh, five different places outside of the terminals so that we have real-time monitoring of truck traffic as an example. So the, d the truck dispatcher or the trucker can, you know, call up the op center and say, oh my heavens, you know, there's a lineup right now, um, I'm going to go have a coffee instead of sitting here idling for 30 minutes or I'm going to go a this route instead of that route. So real-time information that helps that trucker to do, let's say, two or three turns in a day as opposed to one turn in a day, example. Another example, um, this goes to sensors, but I really like this example because it's world-class technology that was developed right here in Halifax uh, by one of our, our local partners. We had something here called the big lift. The locals in the room understand the big lift and, and there could be some bridge folks here. Uh, I was telling John earlier and, and Todd, you know, we have two bridges, the old bridge and the new bridge. <laughs> and so uh, <laughs> they were kind of scratching their head, but in any event, what, what we did during the big lift, uh, we worked with the Bridge Commission and other partners, as I say, to um, create this world-class technology where we put sensors uh, under the bridge that would be able to, on, in real time, measure what we call the air gap. So basically, the surface of the water to the underside of the bridge, so that no matter the tide, no matter the wind, no matter the weather, no matter the load on our suspension bridge, uh, we could track those vessels coming in so that we can make sure that they come in safely with the proper amount of clearance. So we can track that, and we use predictive analytics to understand how that might 
be presenting at a given time of the year, that vessel comes in, it's, uh, the cranes swing into action, and everything happens very quickly because of the data and the technology. The company that helped us to develop that is then able to sell that technology to other ports in the world. That's a great, uh, a great illustration of some of the things going on here. But Todd, when, when we look around the world, uh, a lot of the really exciting things in terms of technology and shipping are happening elsewhere, mm -hmm. Asia, but, mm -hmm. but Europe's doing a lot of interesting things too. Mm -hmm. Is that a fair assessment that North America's maybe a step behind? Um, yes, I, I think it's a fair assessment. I think that uh, the, the broad use of it, there, there's a lot of ideas um, well, I'll back up and say it this way, that as I, my team and I kind of pan the world, there's been more of a reception in Europe and in Asia for the benefits of or transitioning to the technologies like blockchain. Quite frankly, um, even in Africa as well. And I haven't quite put my, my finger on why that's the case. Um, I have a, lot of, a couple of few anecdotes, but uh, since they're not necessarily based in fact, I'll keep those opinions to myself, but it's amazing how the, the rest of the world has gravitated to it. I will say this, there's something that, that Karen said that I wanna delve into, um, and that is the ease that which she talked about the use cases. None of this will trans, none of this will take place, whether it's blockchain platform, whether it's trade lens, whether it's data from sensors, none of that matters and, and this is to my CIO uh, colleagues around the world, I, I still love you, I really do, but it must be get outside of the CIO's office. The CIO needs, is an is a enabler to what the, C, the rest of the C-suite wants to get done. So if the CEO can't talk through, remember I said earlier, the importance of identifying the business problem and what you're trying to solve for, if everyone in the C-suite, including the CIO, can't articulate that clearly, these are just exercises. I call them petri dish exercises, and they're throwaways. Uh, the game changers happen when everybody in the ecosystem, everyone in the C-suite is on board with it. Now all of a sudden it's not an IT project, and it should not be an IT project. It's a business imperative. So we've got some questions coming in from uh, Facebook and WebEx. One plays off of that, uh, Todd, and this is whether the, uh, the industry is ready to embrace smart shipping. This mm -hmm. will take us into the conversation about uh, automation mm -hmm. and some of the, 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 the smart technologies that are appearing on ships but also on, uh, on shore. And what are the transition hurdles? Maybe, Todd, you can start with that and then we'll turn to Karen. Sure. I, I think that you know, so we've already talked about some of these hurdles. Some of these hurdles is getting the entire ecosystem uh, on board for this change. Um, I, I, and I'll say this, when a change takes place and it only thinks about how it improves one part of the ecosystem, it's not effective. I think when you start thinking about smart shipments, how are you gonna get everyone, or smart shipping, how are you gonna get everyone in the ecosystem involved? What role will they play? Uh, what systems may they have to integrate? What business processes may have to change for them? So I think we're still at the early part of really trying to figure all that out. And Karen, how quickly do you think we'll be moving to, you, you mentioned at the, at the start, autonomous mm -hmm. ships, uh, which are being tested in diff different parts of the world. Uh, probably a lot of challenges to scaling that. Yeah. Uh, a lot of automation going on on, uh, on shore in ports. How fast is that going to move? Such an interesting question because, you know, it, it in my mind anyway, it relates to um, the labor force and to the way that we've done things. And, and the shipping industry is a very traditional, very old industry with deep-rooted uh, collective agreements and ways that you know technology is not at the top of the list, if I could put it that way. And so we have to be able to work through people, and we need to be able to get from A to B. Uh, so. I think that what will happen, uh, there, there has to be an effort by ports, I'll just speak for my own organization and also for ports across the country, we've flagged as one of the issues for ports of the future, um, the reskilling, the upskilling of the workforce so that there's a place for the workforce of today in the port of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. What is it? What is that place? What does it look like? And, and I can tell you honestly that that question is not answered. 
So we, we've been doing a lot of work at RBC on uh, the future of work and the skills challenge, did a, a landmark report called Humans Wanted that explored some of these questions. I'm curious what you think the industry needs schools and educators to be doing differently. And then, hey, Todd, you can give us a, a sense of maybe who globally is doing, mm -hmm. doing it well. Sure. So, you know, digitization and data analytics, those are really big words and they need to get broken down so that people can see themselves in those words. So, you know, I was at a thing earlier today where uh, the uh, CEO was talking about the fact that they have this digitization app and everybody takes the test and they sort of see where they are on the scale and, and then there's opportunities through, you know, podcasts or every kind of different thing to basically upscale your own skills, mm -hmm. all right? Great starting point. I love that idea. I'm going to say, you know, what does that look like in our organization? But then when you take that out to people who may not have um, the same level of, of, you know, digital knowledge and the gap is a lot bigger, then what does that look like in a school system, in a community college system, and in a university system? Because that's the future. Now, we're really lucky here. We're very lucky in Halifax because we have many degree-granting institutions. We, we are turning out the students of the future, and so we are extremely lucky and have to do everything that we can to keep them. That's our challenge, is to keep them. So. Uh, I'm just going to finish by saying that one of the things that we're doing in our efforts here, uh, the reskilling, if you like, of, of uh, workers in a port environment, we're we are partnering with our community college because the community college will be training many of the folks that we will need in our industry. So we need to work with the community college to identify the jobs of the future and or the reskilling that can be undertaken in the, in the intervening time. So, I mean, that's all we can do is start that process as, as one employer. But it's, it's not just the data analysts. I loved the, your, your brief description of truck drivers, for instance, and what they're doing. And truck drivers of the future are going to be data analysts they as well. The crane operators analysts. are going to need to have yes. data skills as, uh, as well. Yeah. Todd, when you, and you get to travel the world and, yeah. and see what's going on, who's, um, who's doing it well in terms of developing those skills yeah. of tomorrow? So I think that you know, you, some of you may have heard of an initiative we have in IBM called P-TECH or Pathways um, in Technology. And what this does is, because not every uh, kid is going to go to university, uh, get an MBA or, or a doctorate. Some, that's just not their makeup. And so being able to skill kids and train kids early on from the ninth grade, uh, that equips them for this, what we call new technology era of digitization that's out there. So it makes them equipped coming out of high school in order to walk into these jobs. And so we are seeing, um, we've, we've just in, opened up, I think we're over 30 plus around the world, P-TECH schools around the globe. And we're touching many, many countries around the world. So what this does, it creates a pool of these newly, new, highly skilled, highly trained individuals who otherwise would have, may not have even thought about technology, but they're flourishing. And, and I gotta tell you, you know, to hear their stories of what, would, what they thought would have happened to them uh, versus what is now happening to them, whether they're working for IBM, or quite frankly, this is not just for IBM's benefit, this is for the entire uh, ecosystem where some of these folks are going to work for some of our competitors. But everybody wins when, when, when that takes place. Now that's great leadership by, by IBM, and I think there's a PTAC uh, program here uh, being developed mm -hmm. for, uh, for this region, so really yep. encouraging what, yep. uh, what you're doing. Uh, there's a question coming in from WebEx about uh, the airline industry, and I'm just going to riff off of that to a conversation we were having uh, offstage before we came on. Mm -hmm. When we talk about what's going on, I mean, you describe uh, essentially the development of a platform uh, in global shipping, a data-driven uh, platform, and there's one organization that is really good at this uh, in many sectors. Actually, there's a, there's a few of them, but there's one that's uh, top of mind these days for many, and that's Amazon. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of odd to be bringing Amazon into a shipping conversation, but they're part of the shipping conversation, keeping a lot of people awake at night. <laughs> uh, Todd, what should the shipping world be thinking about? It's not just Amazon, but the, uh, the tech platforms. 10 years from now, what might they be doing to disrupt what we've been talking about? 
I, th I think we're, we're, we're thinking about some of those now. So the things that are inefficiencies that are relatively easy to solve, we need to solve those so that there'll be more money available to be innovative and creative. And that is what Amazon is, is challenging all of us to do. And if we're not doing that, if you're in the, the shipping space or if you're in the, you know, the consumer space, getting more knowledgeable about the consumer, if you're not thinking that way, you're in trouble. Because whether it's Amazon or someone else, uh, they're always, there's always going to be innovation that's taking place that's going to keep them a step ahead. And if you're just going along the way that you are and you don't want to change, and I, and I unfortunately get to deliver some of this news to, to clients sometime, they may have already lost. Um, I would say that if I, if I were an airline, I worked very closely with the airline industry um, in my, one of my recent roles, and I would say if you're in the airline space, uh, if you're not thinking about how the, the Amazons can impact your business, you're behind. But I'm sure they are, right? Because this impacts reservation systems, it, it impacts how orders are booked, um, and quite frankly, whether or not you're in the moving cargo with your airlines, that could be impacted as well. Or if that's something that's a, a big chunk of your business, that might go away. Yeah, they, they've been investing in airplanes, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. Might, so, they, might they get into ships? As much as they move, um, they, they might, they might. I, okay. He's put me on the spot yeah. here. Yeah, so, so Karen, <laughs> when, you, uh, when you hear about Amazon or, or the, the, the tech platforms generally, what do you worry about? Well, you know, I start with the proposition that uh, today, 80% of containerized goods are carried by 10 carriers, okay? So if you get 80% on 10 carriers, and let's just say an Amazon entered the market. So unfortunately, you know, our, th our third uh, uh, hot seat guy wasn't able to make it, and he works for the number one carrier in the world, which is, which is Maersk Line. And I'd love to hear what he, he says on this. But if Amazon were to, to get into the shipping business, you can be sure that it wouldn't take very long before they were one of the top 10. And, and, and the top 10 perhaps becomes five. So I do worry about this. I worry about the mergers and the acquisitions that go on in the industry and the fact that 80% of all containerized cargo is carried by 10 shipping lines. It makes the customer base pretty pretty small for, for a port. Mm. So, um, so there, then, you, you know, you take that and you sort of say, okay, how do I, how do we make ourselves appealable to that skinny little customer base? And again, technology. So doing uh, the leading edge kinds of things that make it um, efficient, effective, high velocity, take the cost out, that's how you compete. All right. And you have to be willing to um, take risk. Uh, we, we call it, we like to call it failing, and, but failing fast. And so the way you fail fast is you have real strict criteria as what defines success and what you're, what you're looking for, what your end state is, and when you can't get there, you let it go. So many times we iterate and we iterate and we iterate before we know it, we've wasted time and someone else has zoomed in with the capability of providing that to your client or to the market. You gotta, you gotta have a very tight set of uh, disciplines to define failing. But failing is not bad. Uh, you know, in, in sports, uh, we, we accept that all the time, right? Team loses a championship and the first thing the fans talk about is, okay, we're, gonna get, we're getting ready for next year, right? In business, we fail and that person gets put to the back of the line. That just doesn't, doesn't make sense. Yeah, it's about learning and developing a learning culture from your, from your, your failures. I, I feel like we've had a master class here in mm -hmm. uh, shipping. It's fascinating. Uh, just as we uh, sort of move towards close in our final minutes, mm -hmm. I wonder if you can talk about what Canada needs. Four trillion dollars move uh, every year through global shipping. And as a country, we, we've got to get a bit bigger share of that. That's essential to our prosperity and all that we take for granted as a society. Mm -hmm. And having more efficient ports is one step. To, uh, to do that. Mm -hmm. But I wonder, Todd, you from a sort of a, a global perspective and Karen from a national perspective, what does Canada have going 
uh, going well and what do we need to really focus on in the next few years to be yeah. more competitive in this space. So, so I'll repeat what I said in private. Uh, I'll, I'll embarrass Karen a little bit here. So I, I think leadership matters. It, it really does. And so I think when um, you have a, a CEO of a port who is who has in, in her mind what strategy she needs to uh, execute, and she's taken into consideration not just her business, but the entire country, I think that's fantastic. And, and honestly, um, you guys are lucky to have her doing that. But I also think that in, in addition to, to that, um, this is, you know, whenever we talk about technology, we tend to think of that as being something gorpy, and we think of that being as something technical, and that's the IT team. These are business imperatives. You cannot execute any part of your business without technology. Technology is in, ingrained in everything we do. The cell phone that you have in your pocket or in your purse has more power in it than the mainframe used to have 30 years ago. They used to run the entire bank, by the way. Okay, so just so just a little bit, a little bit of a perspective on how technology is in everything that we do. So I would say that. Um, um, you guys are way ahead, Canada is way ahead. Um, as a country, you are way ahead and Port Halifax is certainly leading the way. I think when you talk about using data that you gather from sensors or IoT devices to make better decisions or give better capabilities for your customers but also better information for yourselves, that's powerful. Not everyone's doing that. I mean, I can name five ports around the world who have um, and I, I quoted this earlier, and I think Karen almost fell out of her seat. They, they have containers that sit in the port for two weeks. Yeah, that's not good. Two weeks. That's not it just sits good. there. That's not, yeah, that's not that's good. That's not good. <laughs> that is not a good thing. So you go from two weeks to these quick turns yeah. and multiple turns and high efficiency, not touching that container except for as few times as possible because of the $50 cost clip. Um, you guys are ahead of the ahead of the game, and, and if I'm a BCO or if I'm a, a company, whether I'm in the United States or I'm close by, I'm going to want my my goods. Or if I'm an ocean carrier, I'm going to want to use your ports because I can save money. See, when you when you put these efficiencies in place, everybody benefits. And when you're attractive that way, we have the same thing in the United States. We have certain ports who compete against them, uh, one another. Right, Port of Charleston competes against the Port of Houston. And it's all about efficiencies. So hats off to, uh, to Canada. Yeah. So Karen, our CEO is going to talk a bit tomorrow uh, about Canada at our best. We know what Canada looks like when we're at our best, and we know what we need to be our best. I'm wondering in this space what you think Canada needs to be our best in a digitally enabled shipping world. We are very good collaborators in the, in the port system. We're, we're lucky that way. We're good collaborators. We share best practices. There's a huge uh, foundation upon which we can build. So number one is to make sure that we keep doing it. And, and that has to be done at a, at a CEO level. And it just has to, you know, I'm very lucky because my colleagues in Montreal, in Vancouver, and in Prince Rupert think the same way. So we can actually work together. So that, that's key. Uh, seeing that future is also key so that you can map out the steps to get there. And I think that, you know, when I, when I look out, I look at some of the great things that have been done over the past uh, number of years. So, for example, we have our super clusters. We talked about this earlier. We have oceans here, uh, which is, which is uh, helpful for us. But they have AI in, in uh, Montreal, so it's equally as important for us to link into that one and into the food one in, um, you know, in, the, in the western part of, uh, of Canada. So one of the things that we need to do a better job of at is understanding the inventory of what we have today. Like we really, and I'm not talking just the ports, but you know, in our space, we need to have a better understanding of what's out there so that we can either lend or get and uh, share. 
because it's the sharing that we do well that's going to take us into the future. That's a great point to uh, wrap up on. I one of our challenges as, as, as a country is that we're literally too provincial and, uh, and regional. And one of the impressive things you've done here in Halifax is connect Halifax with Vancouver, which people may not think is intuitive that there should be uh, sh information sharing, but you are very dependent on each other's success. Right. And your success uh, separately will be uh, greater if you uh, work cooperatively as you're, yeah. as you're doing. Uh, as we do at every Disruptors, as a token of our appreciation, we make a contribution in the uh, names of our guests to a charity of their, their choice. Uh, Todd and Karen have uh, both selected charities. Uh, Todd, I'm going to ask you to say a few words about why you picked, uh, I think it's called the, the Hillsdale Food Bank. Yes, uh, yeah, um, Hillside Food Outreach. Hillside, uh, I'm sorry. In, in Westchester County, where um, IBM is headquartered, Armonk, um, is one of the highest per capita income counties um, in the United States. However, there are tens of thousands of people who go to bed hungry every single uh, night. And so Hillside Food Outreach is something that started small and now it pans not just Westchester County, but also the, the entire New York metro area. And we feed literally thousands of people, uh, whether it's seniors who are living alone or whether it's families who just don't uh, have enough income. Now, there's a selection process. I mean, it's very well vetted, but it's something I've been part of now for over 10 years. Uh, actually, was the president of the foundation for many years, and I'm um, very proud that, uh, for your contribution. Well, thank you for sharing that. And, and Karen, you selected the YWCA. Maybe you could s share a few words on uh, why you chose that. Sure, and, and thank you for, for that. So we have um, an initiative in the city uh, which started about a year ago. It's called the Women's Leadership Initiative, where um, there are 20 senior women, I guess I'm one now, uh, are, are inviting five emerging leaders to meet two, three times a year together, uh, a diverse group of emerging leaders, uh, culturally, um, you know, the, the gamut, newcomers to the country, uh, teaching tricks of the trade, uh, the networking, the other things that you need to be successful in climbing the ladder to success. So put it towards that initiative and uh, work to developing our young female emerging leaders. That's a great, uh, well, both, both great messages. So thank, thank you for, uh, for sharing that. Uh, if you've enjoyed this conversation, please uh, sign up for our mailing list. Uh, join, we've got 5,000 people now as part of the Disruptors community. Want, uh, lo want lots more joining. If uh, you want to hear this conversation again or share it, uh, you, you'll get it on a podcast in the next few days. Uh, get it through your usual podcast channels or through uh, SoundCloud. And please uh, mark your calendars for the next RBC Disruptors, which is April 24th in Toronto, when we'll be talking to Ray Reddy about an amazing company he's building called Ritual. Uh, and uh, he's got great stories about uh, what it's like to start from nothing and create a global, uh, global enterprise. Todd, Karen, thank you so much for sharing your stories, your insights today, and being part of uh, this conversation. Everyone here in person and watching on Facebook and WebEx, thank you for being part of the conversation. Uh, have a great evening.